In my previous video, I described what the Radiant Citadel was and the first four adventures found within Journey through the Radiant Citadel. In this video, I will go over the next four adventures. I'll try to go over as much detail as I can, but do note that I won't cover absolutely everything because these adventures do go quite in depth. If you haven't seen my part 1 of this video, I'll link it in the description to check it out. Nothing in there is really needed to watch this video, but if you're curious about the first four adventures, they'll be there. With that, let us continue with Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, Part 2. Chapter 5, Sins of Our Elders Your adventure begins at the curving walls of Yenido. Atop the walls, tall, colorful flags and ribbons flutter from poles. Traders, guards, and workers come and go through a grand gate, passing from the surrounding farmlands into the maze of graceful structures beyond. Yenido is a city known for its citizens' familial loyalty and reverence for tradition, as well as for its ancestral spirits. Humans and Dragonborn are the most populous folk in Yenido. Humans from Yenido are primarily dark-haired and dark-eyed, and Dragonborn have colorings based on their bloodlines, most commonly red or blue-green scales. As you watch, a pale mist rises from within the city. The fog emanating from within Yenido encompasses the city, lightly obscuring every street and building, including the interiors. You realize that this fog is unnatural and emanates an aura of enchantment magic. As you near the city gate, you notice the guards and other travelers are bewildered by the strange weather but do their best to try to ignore it. When asked about the fog, Locals say they've never seen anything like this. Soon after you arrive at the gate, three hostile gargoyles swoop down to menace the people nearby. The gargoyles all resemble the same fierce-looking woman with a mouth full of fangs, claw-like nails, and feathered wings. Two guards cover the retreat of panicked locals as the gargoyles attack traders' wagons or anything that threatens them. The gargoyles fight until destroyed, and they dissipate into mists when defeated leaving no remains behind. The fog covering the area vanishes soon after the gargoyles appear. As the fog fades, the guards and other locals menaced by the gargoyles look momentarily perplexed by where they are and any damage that's been done around them. Then, they stoically go about their business again as if nothing had happened. When you ask them about the fog, the monsters, or other occurrences within the fog, they react with bewilderment. Casting the Detect Magic spells reveals that the locals, in fact almost all the creatures in the city, radiate an aura of enchantment magic. There is one exception to this. As you question the nearby people, a local magistrate notices you. An official wearing a red and blue outfit embroidered with phoenix designs approaches you. I apologize for my impertinence, they say, but I have an odd question to ask. Have you just suffered an unusual experience? They introduce themselves as Kun An Jun. You can sense that this magistrate is the only person who doesn't have the aura of magic around them. An Jun is quietly distraught about the events affecting Yenido. They can't make sense of what's happening and fear their suffering visions or worse. Noting how you've been able to witness the fog and creatures within it, An Jun is relieved and shares with you some information. No one else in the city has seen the fog, but it's been rising and falling multiple times every day for weeks. The fog used to occur only every now and then, but has been growing more frequent. An Jun has tried to tell people about it, but is always ignored. Strange monsters have slain people in the fog. Those who've witnessed the tragedies are shocked anew by the sight of bodies when the fog dissipates. The deaths are always considered accidents or bizarre, but isolated incidents. An Jun asks you to help them uncover what mysterious magic is afflicting Yenido and promises to inform the city's rulers of your service. You agree to assist them, and the magistrate notes three locations you should investigate. The construction site, located in the Tiger District outside the city's walls, has suffered numerous attacks and unexplained setbacks. The Park of Elders in the Heitei District has also seen several attacks as well. The city's oldest tea shop, located in the Phoenix District, has found two nobles wounded and nearly dead outside it only a few days ago. With locations in mind, you set off into the city and begin your investigation. Through your time exploring Yenido, you learn of the many customs of the city. 
Unido's people are expected to present a brave face regardless of what hardships they're facing personally. Talking about another person's mishap in public brings great shame to that person. To be good neighbors, people don't speak openly about others' troubles. Residents of Unido readily assist their neighbors and help out one another if asked, but also go to great lengths to ignore or plausibly not see things that might be embarrassing to others. Lastly, to speak ill of the royal family, particularly the popular Queen Jin Mi, is to betray a profound trust. You eventually decide to investigate the construction site at the Tiger District. The Tiger District is a relatively new part of the city and is still undergoing construction, particularly along the forested stretch being cleared to the northwest. When you visit the area near the forest, you find a large construction site full of scaffolding and equipment. Shortly after you arrive, Overseer Huang Jun Soon, the official in charge of the site, approaches you. Huang Jun Soon is friendly and speaks evenly, but she's frustrated by her site's setback and is protective of her workers. She wants to know what your business is and asks you to leave if you are simply sightseeing. Seeing your weapons, however, she becomes hopeful that you've been hired by the magistrates to investigate the recent accidents at the site. You inform her that you are, and question her about the strange events that have been occurring. Jung Soon doesn't know anything about the fog, strange events, or attacks on the camp. However, you sense that she's holding back something in her response. Things such as finding dents on her weapons, or personally suffering unexplainable wounds at random. Her laborers are in constant fear. They think some creature or gang is trying to harm them. No one's seen anything, but accidents and sabotage are common. She's frustrated with the city's magistrates, believing they're failing to protect her people. Dangerous animals live in the nearby forest, particularly tigers, and she has guards to keep such threats at bay. Regardless, she doesn't think animals are to blame for the danger around the worksite. She believes it's most likely sabotage. During the conversation with Jung Soon, you notice a fog drifting into the worksite from the southeast. Soon, the worksite is lightly obscured by the fog. A moment after the fog rises, four tigers appear from the direction of the forest. These hostile tigers are 12 feet long and have blue-tinged fur. The site's workers and hired guards flee upon seeing the tigers, but Jung Soon stands her ground. The two of you fight off against the tigers and fend them off for as long as you can. After a while, the tigers begin to vanish into the mist, one by one. Before the last tiger vanishes, it retreats, heading toward the forest north of the construction site. When the battle ends, the fog vanishes. Neither Jung Soon nor the workers recall the fog or the tigers. You follow the tiger's path into the forest, hoping to find more clues as to what has happened. The path is made of worn muddy stones. It ends at a rocky pedestal bearing a slab of marble covered in moss and a simple stone lantern. A faint blue flame glows within the lantern. You clear the moss and reveal an inscription that reads, Day Wan Ha, Warrior for the People. The lantern bears a magical flame that emits dim light but no heat. You notice that the candle has an aura of invocation magic. Speaking the name, Day Wan Ha, the lantern momentarily flares in intensity. You decide to take it with you and part towards the Phoenix District looking for the tea shop. The oldest area in the city, the Phoenix District, is adjacent to the royal palace known as the Seat of Dragons. It is populated exclusively by nobles and the wealthy elite. Despite locals not recollecting the attacks in the area, the people know many have been harmed on the streets and fear that some gang or murder is at large. The tea shop you are looking for is famous and is easily found by asking the nearby people. They point you in the direction and you head towards the tea shop. The oldest tea shop in Yanido was simply called the tea shop when it was built hundreds of years ago and so it remains known to this day. The shop is decorated with hundreds of teacups arrayed on shelves. Many cups bear the names of famous past patrons, adventurers, nobles, and royals. The owner, a talkative human named Bi Chin Hei, greets you when you enter. Chin Hei grows tactern when asked about the recent attack near his shop or the troubles in the city, speaking about these events only in vague terms. He doesn't want the area around his shop to be considered dangerous. You try to carefully pry more information. Chin Hei mentions that the two nobles attacked near his shop were named Na De Xiam and Da Zhu Wan. They often play the game of Baduk at the nearby Baduk Hall. 
you thank the tea shop owner and head towards the Baduk Hall, three blocks away from Chen Pei's tea shop. At the Baduk Hall, dozens of pairs of players concentrate at tables covered in circular black and white pieces. You ask around for the two individuals that were attacked, and the attendants direct you to Dei Xiem and Zhu Wan. Na Dei Xiem, a dwarf man, and Da Zhu Wan, a human woman, are in the middle of an intense game. They're not interested in talking at the moment. The pair are happy to talk to you after their game, but it will take three hours to reach its conclusion. Feeling a bit impatient, you guide the two and provide strategic tips for the players causing the game to conclude in 10 minutes. Now ready to talk, Dei Xiem and Zhu Wan call for rice wine and tells you the following details. During a visit to the tea shop after dusk about a week ago, Dei Xiem and Zhu Wan were both nearly killed. They both recall seeing a strange woman lingering near the shop. The next thing either of them remembered, they were waking up. Passerby found them near the shop and summoned a priest to aid them. Neither of the nobles know who the woman was and they have no memory of the fog. However, one of the nobles reluctantly reveals that they think she was a Guai Xin. Guai Xin are the spirits of those who were wronged in life and died without receiving justice. A Guai Xin's power grows over time, making it important for these troubled spirits to be quelled quickly. The nobles don't know why such a spirit might be lurking around the tea shop, but they suspect the proprietor, Jin Hei, would know. You return to the tea shop and ask Jin Hei about the spirits seen around his shop, pressing him intently. He has seen a spirit that resembles a long dead but regular customer who was famous in her time, Magistrate Dei Wan Ha. He has infrequently glimpsed the spirit near his shop, but also once at the Park of the Elders when he was walking home around midnight. Dei Wan Ha was an active magistrate and hero of the people, responsible for many social works. She was ultimately overshadowed by the last queen, Yong Su. Chin Hei doesn't know what happened to her after that. As he explains this, he fetches a pair of teacups from the shelf. The cups are a set and bear the names Yong Ji, the uncle of the current queen and brother of Yong Su and Won Ha. As the cup bears Won Ha's name is taken down, it glows with a faint blue light and pulses every time the name Won Ha is spoken. It also flickers when brought near the lantern from the Tiger District. You ask to borrow the teacups, and Jin Hei allows you to do so. He also informs you that if you wish to find Yong Ji, you can find him at his home and shows you the direction to Yong Ji's house. You thank the man for his time and proceed onwards to the home of Yong Ji. When you arrive, four guards at the gate to Yong Ji's estate prevents you from meeting with the nobleman uninvited, but you convince the guards to let you see Yong Ji. They escort you to the estate's gardens. The place is a serene sanctuary hidden from the clamor of the surrounding city. A few moments later, an elderly dragonborn man enters the garden. This is Yong Ji. As the uncle of the current queen, Jin Mi, and the brother of the previous queen, Yong Su, Yong Ji is accustomed to wealth and privilege. A life spent enjoying his status has made him charming and personable, but also haughty. As he ages, however, he remembers the few true friends he once had and regrets how he treated Dei Won Ha. The elderly dragonborn's red scales aren't as lustrous as they once were, and he wears fine silk robes to compensate. You greet the dragonborn and explain to him your investigation. Yong Ji listens intently when you speak. When you mention Dei Won Ha, he's surprised and grows reflective. You show him the lantern and the teacup, and he begins to recount Dei Won Ha's past. Dei Won Ha was a brilliant magistrate and hero of the people. Much of the prosperity and equality Yunido now enjoys is due to her work. Few remember Won Ha's efforts, attributing them to Yong Ji's sister, the former queen, Yong Su. Although the people once honored Won Ha, the magistrate died in relative obscurity. Yong Ji reveals that he was personally responsible for undermining Won Ha's work. He ended up crediting her success to his sister, Queen Yong Su. He did this not out of malice, but out of devotion to his family and the crown, believing any individual who the people place above the ruling class must be treated as a threat. Yong Ji regrets what he did, but he has never worked up the courage to make amends to Won Ha's spirit, 
He fears doing so will tarnish his sister's memories and, by extension, his niece's rule. You try to convince Yong Ji that something strange is happening in the city, but he is not surprised. He doesn't recall the fog, but he's seen Won Hu's Guai Shin several times at the royal park, called the Park of the Elders, specifically late at night near the statue to his sister Yong Su. Since Won Ha had no surviving family members, he finds it conceivable that her Guai Shin could have lingered for years since her death. In the meantime, the Guai Shin must have grown powerful enough to affect the city. Yong Ji has called on spirit arbiters to investigate the park in the past, but they found nothing. He encourages you to seek out the spirit at the Park of the Elders around midnight. You agree, and he produces a tarnished gold amulet with Won Ha's name etched on it. This was one of her symbols of office, a memento of their former friendship that he's kept for years. When brought near the lantern from the Tiger District, or the teacup from the Phoenix District, the amulet faintly glows. You leave the estate and wait until midnight before heading to the Park of the Elders. The Park of the Elders is a beautiful public space devoted to walking and peaceful contemplation. It features a stately monument to the late Queen Yong Su, aunt to Queen Jin Mi. You approach the statue and inspect it a bit more. The monument depicts a regal dragonborn seated on an ornate throne, a vision of wisdom and grace. She cradles a large scroll in one arm and raises the other as if about to speak. Stone plaques set into the statue's foundation are engraved with Queen Yong Su's many achievements. You read the plaques and recall that many of the Queen's accomplishments echo those of the obscure magistrate, Dae Won Ha. The beauty of the park changes as fog spreads from the base of the monument to Queen Yong Su. Something shapeless and malevolent wraps itself around the statue, coalescing as a robed figure that shrieks in pain and rage. The Guai Shin of Dae Won Ha manifests from the fog at the base of the statue as a ghost. She appears as a middle-aged woman with dark hair and mournful features. Two gargoyles emerge out of the mist along with the spirits bearing Won Ha's face. Despite being driven by sorrow and rage, the Guai Shin of Dae Won Ha is willing to speak to you. You try to calm her by presenting a few of the items from Dae Won Ha's past. Once the Guai Shin is calmed enough to talk, she tells you the full history of what has occurred. For decades, Dae Won Ha dedicated her life to Yunido, serving as a magistrate and protector as the city-state developed into a hub for trade. The lower-class laborers and artisans of Yunido reaped the benefits of the city-state's success. The common people cherished her, but the attitude of others was not so kind. In time, merchants seeking to line their pockets began to embezzle government funds. City planners accelerated expansion into the forest without care for sustainability, and the local nobility began to monopolize the benefits of the booming economy. Whenever Won Ha protested, royal advisor Yong Ji dismissed her concerns and undermined her authority. Eventually, political tensions turned the folk hero into a figure of infamy. Meanwhile, Yong Ji publicly gave Queen Yong Su credit for all of Won Ha's achievements, ensuring that the queen's legend would never fade while Won Ha was forgotten. Unable to bear the lie swallowed by her beloved people, Won Ha grew ill and died. She passed on with no money, no clan, and no deeds credited to her name. When Queen Young Su died 10 years ago, a monument to her was unveiled in the city's Park of the Elders. The next night, Won Ha rose as a Guai Shin and began haunting the monument. When no family claimed the spirit as their descendant, the spirit arbiters Magistrates responsible for Rogue Guai Shin tried to quell the angry spirit. As a former magistrate herself, though, Won Ha's spirit managed to avoid the spirit arbiters. Just as Won Ha was intentionally removed from Yunido's story during her lifetime, her Guai Shin believes that she has been forgotten by the city's people. She's angry that the city she dedicated her life to has forgotten her. She uses her accursed fog to make Yunido's people suffer, but forget why leaving them with only pain and quiet confusion. Once you have learned Dae Won Ha's story, you display the three relics of her past to present evidence that the people still remember her, the lantern from the Tiger District, the teacup from the Phoenix District, and the amulet Yongji kept safe. The Guai Shin begins to marvel at the fact that she hasn't been fully forgotten and she thanks you for bringing these mementos to her. 
Once Day Wan Ha's Guai Shen is reassured that she hasn't been forgotten, the memory affecting fog ceases to appear, and the curse afflicting the people of Yunido ends, restoring their memories. To lay the Guai Shen to rest, you begin reminding the city of Day Wan Ha's historic role in the city's ascent to prosperity. Kun An Jun helps you with this and suggests restoring the magistrate's shrine outside the city and circulating records of Wan Ha's works. Once the Guai Shen is put to rest, An Jun makes Queen Jin Mi aware of your role in saving the city. The Queen meets with you, hailing you as a hero. Chapter 6 Gold for Fools and Princess This adventure begins with your arrival in the city of Anissa. The city-state of Anissa in the east of the Sensa Empire is ruled by the aging king Dayara. Thanks to the wealth of the gold-worn mine, the city's gold production far outpaces that of its neighbors. Gold mining is a respected career crucial to the empire's prosperity. Those who work with the riches of the earth number among the land's most respected artisans. To support its members, the Aram Guild allows miners and craftspeople to build social and professional connections, better their crafts, and organize for improved labor conditions. The people of Anissa value education highly and the city is home to Anissa Academy, the only university in the empire. Politically, the city has enjoyed years of peace under King Dayara's rule, but many dread his inevitable retirement. You overhear that the city's famed gold mine, the Goldworn, has collapsed. Nearby people are gathering to hear news of the missing miners, and two local princes will be speaking. Among the gossip, you pick and gather a few tidbits of information. Prince Simboan, the son of Anissa's king, is not widely respected in the empire. Prince Karina comes from the neighboring city of Neba. He's a charismatic figure who's well liked by the Aram Guild. You listen to the gossip as you stroll through the city until you eventually stumble into the city square. Locals crowd a shaded square, listening to a fervent argument between two well-dressed human men wearing dark colors and gold jewelry. This isn't your place, Prince Karina. One man shouts. This isn't your city. The trap miners are my responsibility. As soon as the entrance is cleared, Karina interrupts the man. But these are my people. I value the friendship of the Orum Guild, and I stand with my friends in their time of need. But don't worry, Prince Simbon. We can find something safe for you to do while we bring our missing family home. It appears the two that are arguing go by the name of Prince Simbon and Prince Karina. Voices in the crowd arise as they declare support for one prince or the other. Most of the folk wearing the grimy tunics of miners are impressed when Karina speaks, while the Anisan city folk shout in agreement when Simbon speaks. As the debate continues, a muscular dwarf miner carrying a polished copper pick approaches you. This is Uzoma, the overseer at the Gold Warren. Uzoma Batten was selected as the Gold Warren's overseer due to her compassion and diligence. She sees this position as the highest possible honor and strives daily to be worthy as she labors alongside her fellow miners. Determined to do right by them, Uzoma doesn't hesitate to challenge orders she deems unfair, even if those orders come directly from King Dayara. Uzoma bluntly notes to you that she's looking for adventurers. She hopes to hire you to head into the mine and rescue the trapped miners, offering a hefty sum of gold. Uzoma also fills you in on the tension in the crowd. The folk of the Sensa Empire are loyal to the empires and their own city-states in equal measure. As such, most folk of Anissa favor Prince Simbon as the would-be heir to Empress Anaya. The Aurum Guild has thrown its support behind the more adventurous Prince Karina of Neba, so many of the miners in the crowd favor him. Simbon has technically been given charge of the rescue mission by his father, King Dayara. However, the prince seems rattled by the responsibility. Karina has been in the city on private business for weeks, but he made a very public appearance after the accident at the mine. He's taken it on himself to volunteer for the rescue mission. You agree to Uzoma's request to save the trapped miners. After agreeing, Uzoma says she has someone she wants you to meet. It is a young miner who saw monsters in the mine before making his escape. She motions for you to follow her through the crowd. As Uzoma leads you through the crowd, you notice movement in the shadows across the street. Shouts ring out at the crowd's edge as massive, glowing scorpions rush from the shadowed alley. Prince Karina draws a sword and races forward, while Prince Simbon hesitates. The crowd flees, leaving only you and the princess to face the five giant scorpions. 
Uzoma stands back and watches as the encounter unfolds. The princes are friendly and quick to ally with you. The scorpions are hostile and of a rare fluorescent breed known as a twilight dune scorpion that rarely venture from the desert depths. You battle against the scorpions and when they are defeated, they vanish similarly to that of a summoned creature. The amount of creatures present, however, is far more than any common summoning magic will allow. In the aftermath of the battle, both princes thank you for your assistance. As the eldest son of the King of Neba, Karina was raised knowing he might be named heir to the land's ruler, Empress Aenea. In time, Karina grew close to the Empress. He came to see Aenea as a benevolent aunt, and his place as her heir seemed assured. Prince Simbone, however, is in a strange situation. His family seeks to ensure she chooses him as her heir, though he has never aspired to the position. In reality, Simbone believes his poor tactical mind and hedonistic bent make him a lackluster candidate. After the battle, you investigate the alley the scorpions originated from and find a partial series of smeared magical runes drawn on the alley wall. These runes belong to that of a conjuration magic. Soon after the giant scorpions are defeated, the crowd throngs Prince Simbon and Prince Karina, lauding their heroics and asking what they'll do next. Uzoma ignores the chaos and guides you to a young human at the crowd's edge whom she introduces as Awa, a young miner who escaped the gold warren. At Uzoma's prompting, Awa shares the following story. Awa and the rest of his crew, including his mother, were working a new excavation when it collapsed. He and the others were trying to escape when a snarling, eight-legged beast appeared. The beast would have killed Awa, but his mother, Sihaya, defended him. The creature attacked her in turn and dragged her away. In the chaos, Awa was separated from the others. He made his way to the entrance and was the last miner out before the entrance collapsed. No one else from his crew escaped. He begins to describe to you what the creature looked like and you recognize the creature as an Aram Vorax, a predator that eats precious metals but is thought to be extinct in the region. After Awa shares his experience, Uzoma tells you how King Dayara has been pushing to increase output at the mine to please Empress Anaya. The excavation of the newer tunnels occurred so quickly that there was not enough time to fully reinforce them. The Aram Guild has been warning of the potential for collapses within the mine but has been ignored. After you finish your conversation with Awa, shouting among the prince's supporters causes Ozoma to intervene. That's enough, says Ozoma. All this talk is wasting breath. The crews at the entrance should have it cleared and shored up by the day's end. We'll sort out who's on the rescue team then, but for now. As Ozoma speaks, Karina and Simbone both step up, interrupting her to announce they'll gladly take a place in the rescue party. Their followers begin arguing again until Azuma blows a piercing whistle. If you want to help, stop arguing and do what I need you to do. Prince Karina, you'll come to the Gold Warden with me. Prince Simbon, go find out what could be waiting for us in the mine. Let's get this done. Uzoma tasks Simbon and you with seeking out Kedjo, a high priest visiting Anisa Academy. Kedjo has a rich understanding of the Sensa Empire's history and might know what lurks in the mine. Prince Simbon escorts you to Anisa Academy, a 10 minute walk through the city. He's personable and speaks plainly, saying Karina only seeks to make himself a hero to gain favor with the wealthy Aram Guild. It's clear Simbon is frustrated, but you recognize his complaints conceal jealousy of the well-liked rival prince. After a brisk walk, you arrive to the Anisa Academy. The campus of Anisa Academy consists of buildings clustered around a wide courtyard. It's crowded with students professors, and acolytes of the Faceless Prophet, the Sensa Empire's clergy, milling between buildings. As you seek out Kedjo, Prince Simbon shares the following information. Kedjo has been in residence at the academy for only the past week. Visits from the high priest are rare. According to Simbon's friend, the entire campus is abuzz with speculation that Kedjo came to the academy to conduct secret research. You eventually learn that Kejo has taken up offices on the top floor of the Academy's library. When the two of you arrive at the library, a librarian ushers you to Kejo's private room on the library's top floor. Outside, two guards stand alert. Within, open tomes and scrolls lie spread across several tables, and Kejo makes no effort to hide any of his notes. Kejo expresses delight at seeing Prince Simbon and respectfully greets you. During the conversation, Kejo discreetly mocks the prince, 
going so far as to sympathize with Simbon about how straining it must be to busy himself among the common rabble or visit the library. When told about the creatures in the mine, Kejo believes the description matches that of monsters called Aram Voraxes. He declares this is impossible as they're long extinct in the region. Aram Voraxes are gold-eating predators that once claimed all the mines of the Sensa Empire as their territory. They were hunted down by the Emperor Kasa a millennium ago. The creatures were eradicated from the region, and none have been seen since. Regarding Awa's story, Kecho doesn't believe the tale of the miner. If any of the creatures had survived the purge, their hunger for gold would have revealed the creatures long ago. Kejo suggests that the creatures could be nothing more than overgrown rats. During the conversation with Kejo, you catch sight of an interesting detail in the notes spread across the room. The note suggests Kejo is researching a unique conjuration spell, one to summon powerful creatures and cause them to linger for longer than usual. After a while, Priest curtly declares he needs to get back to his studies and dismisses you. Not wanting to stir up any trouble, you take your leave from the library. After leaving the library, you ask Simbon about Kejo's insult or assessment of his leadership potential. The prince tries to shrug it off. He doesn't think much of his future as a leader. You try to encourage Simbon to take his role as someone the people look up to more seriously. Doing so earns you Simbon's respect. Prince Simbon suggests the two of you head to the Gold Warren, which lies a few hours north of Anissa. He doesn't relish the idea of venturing into the tunnels, but he truly wants to help those trapped within. He also hates the idea of Karina starting the search effort without him. Simbon calls for a coach to convey the two of you there. With that, you take the carriage and make your journey north to the Gold Warren. When you arrive at the Gold Warren, you find golden statues of royals smiling down on visitors from atop the impressive multi-story entrance. While rubble spills from the opening gates leading into the mines, a path has been cleared through it into the darkness. A crowd gathers around the mine's huge entrance tunnels. Nearby, Uzoma and Prince Karina watch as miners inspect the new post shoring up the damaged tunnel. Uzoma welcomes you and asks you to enter the mine and find the missing miners. Both Prince Karina and Prince Simbon plan to join you and won't be dissuaded. Uzoma notes that the missing miner should have been working in the tunnel south of the prominent junction. She provides you a general direction to reach the section of the mines worth investigating. As you make your way through the mine, the two princes bicker constantly. During the expedition, Prince Karina seeks opportunities to look heroic and undermine his rival, Prince Simbon. In his show of bravado, Prince Karina drops a small note from his pocket. You pick it up and examine it and notice a picture of runes. These pictures match the painted runes from the nearby alley of the attack in the city square. When asked about the paper, Karina is dismissive, claiming to have found it on the street. You sternly tell him that you'll be holding on to this note, and he reluctantly agrees. After a short march from the mine entrance, you reach a large junction with tracks that lead into a few side tunnels. One tunnel leading north and two tunnels stretching south are still open. Just in front of a massive mine track turntable, a body lies splayed on the rocky ground. Even at a distance, it's clear this miner died not from falling rubble, but from terrible slashing wounds. As you approach the turntable, you hear skittering emanating from a nearby tunnel. Suddenly, five Aram Voraxes rush to attack and you fend them off with mighty blows. When the Aram Vorax are defeated, they vanish. The body on the ground is that of a missing miner named Enwa who was killed by an Aram Vorax attack. You search the area and see that numerous Aram Vorax claw marks lead from the southwest tunnel. You head down that tunnel and reach an opening. Openings into three rough hewn caves line the northern walls. You notice signs of combat and bloodstains along the tunnel. The tunnel ends in a rockfall that would take days to clear. These three caverns are recent excavations seeking new profitable veins of gold. A tunnel dug by claws extends from the easternmost of the newly dug caverns. As you approach it, you hear sounds of movement from the large cavern beyond. The walls of this chamber are crudely dug and covered with scratches, particularly around seams of glistening ore. A half dozen deep alcoves circle a broad, open space. This is the nest of the Aram Vorax pack, including five Aram Voraxes and an Aram Vorax den leader. You fight another set of Aram Vorax and they vanish into the air as you defeat them. During the fight, 
Prince Karina tries to eliminate Prince Simbon as a rival. Karina antagonizes the Arm Voraxes, then slips behind the other prince, leaving the monsters to attack Timbon. Once all of the creatures are vanquished, you begin to investigate the room. You find two bodies that lie in the center of the chamber. The bodies here are those of two of the missing miners bearing many claw and bite marks. Three survivors, including Awa's mother, Zahaya, are holed up in an alcove to the west. They have blocked the alcove entrance with crates and mining beer. You investigate the area where the survivors were hiding and find a series of runes drawn on the cave wall with chalk. You recognize these being nearly identical to the ones in the alley that followed the scorpion attack. Once you have found the survivors, you begin to lead them out to leave the mine. Before you do, Zahaya whispers that they saw a stranger with long braided hair and colorful robes in the mines before the collapse. The stranger was drawing the runes in the cavern where the survivors were hiding. When you exit the cavern, you decide to confront Prince Karina over his attempt to harm Prince Mbon and the many evidence against him that you've discovered. He answers your question confidently, deflecting accusations while smugly claiming no responsibility. Through a bit of intimidation and persuasion, he eventually reveals the following information. Both the giant scorpions and the armed Voraxes were conjured by Kejo to let Karina play the part of the hero and increase his chances of becoming Empress's next heir. At Karina's behest, Kejo crafted the ritual that brought the Arum Voraxes to the Gold Warren. In exchange for positioning Karina to become Anaya's heir, Kejo expects to influence Karina's policy decisions once Karina becomes Emperor. When confronted with his responsibility for the miners who died for this charade, the prince merely shrugs. He blames the Arum Guild for the shoddy conditions that caused the collapse, conveniently ignoring that the burrowing Arum Voraxes clearly contributed to them. When you emerge from the Gold Warren, Zoma and a crowd of miners flock around the group and hustle off any survivors to have their wounds tended to. Uzoma is quick to thank and pay you. When you mention Prince Karina endangering Prince Simbon to Uzoma, she's surprised and listens to your story. You reveal that Prince Karina and High Priest Kejo were responsible for the Aram Vorax's appearance and back up your claim with evidence. Uzoma is outraged. Prince Karina's confidence rapidly flags and he makes a weak attempt at excuses, claiming that you are lying on Prince Simbon's behalf. Simbon speaks out against Karina, cutting through his excuses. With Prince Simbon's support, Uzoma throws status to the wind and orders her miners to lock Karina in a nearby office while she summons the guards. After Karina's formal arrest, Uzoma demands an immediate investigation of High Priest Kejo's lodgings to confirm your claims. Bolstered by Prince Simbon's influence, she drives immediate action. You join her, Simbon, and a group of guards in a surprise visit to Kejo's chambers where the high priest is caught off guard. His research notes, matching the runes in the Gold Warren, are discovered. The high priest is quickly taken into custody. In the aftermath of Karina and Kejo's arrest, Prince Simbon thanks you for supporting him in revealing Prince Karina's plot. He rewards you with two of his family's treasures, an adamantine chain shirt and a ring of warmth emblazoned with the sunburst symbol of Anissa. Simbon says the ring carries with it the warmth of his homeland's son and his family's friendship. It's also clear that Simbon is impressed with Azoma. Together, the pair might become a force to be reckoned with in Anissa and beyond. Chapter 7 Trial of Destruction this adventure begins as you approach the town of Atizalan. The road weaves through a stretch of rainforest that flanks a deep valley, drawing near the town of Atizalan. Past a bend, smoke rises through the trees and shouts ring out. An overturned wagon lies in the road, and through the smoke you can see people being attacked by a serpentine creatures wreathed in flames. Two fire snakes and two salamanders have ambushed three travelers from Atizalan. The three travelers defend a wagon full of food, flowers, and colorful crafts. Once you deal with the vicious elementals, the ground heaves as a small earthquake ripple through the area. The sound of wood splintering and trees falling echoes from deeper in the forest, but the tremor soon passes. In the aftermath of the battle and earthquake, the travelers are thankful for your help. Their leader introduces herself as Amayali. Amayali has lived in Edisalon for years. After fire elementals destroyed her birth village and killed her parents, neighbors took her in and moved to Edisalon. 
There, she learned a sense of community and acquired a strong desire to help others. As a youth, her aptitude with tools and weapons led her to train with the inventors known as the Shapers of Obsidian in Itsimikam. She returned to Edisalon as an adult to ensure her birth village's fate would never befall her new home. Her many useful inventions impressed the people of Edisalon and she eventually became a local leader. She asked you if her caravan might travel back to Edisalon with you and you agree. Along the way, she shares the following information. The region around Edisalon is suffering from earthquakes and incursions from fiery monsters. Three days ago, Amayali sent four of the town's best warriors to seek insight from the Watchers of the Ashes. They dwell at the Twin Gods Observatory, a site of volcanic study that normally warns Edisalon of impending earthquakes and eruptions. The warriors have not returned. Amayali and her fellow travelers intended to look for the warriors and then take offerings to the Gate of Illumination, a shrine to the gods, in hopes of appeasing them and quelling the earthquakes. The group has traveled only a couple of miles from Edisalon and the journey has proven more dangerous than expected. For their safety, her group must abandon its mission. Once you and Amayali reach Edisalon, she thanks you again and asks if you'll do her another favor. She's still concerned about her town's warriors. She asks you go to the Twin Gods Observatory and find out what happened to them. In return, you will have earned the gratitude of her people. You agree and set off to Edisalon. The town of Edisalon has seen better days. Many of the stalls in the town's paved central market are closed as local shore up buildings damaged by the recent earthquake or reinforce the town walls. You speak with the locals about threats in the area and learn the following pieces of information. Most of the creatures attacking the area are salamanders or fire snakes that dwell near volcanoes. They don't usually attack settlements. The earthquake the town recently suffered is the fourth this month. Earthquakes aren't uncommon, but this is far more than usual. A fire giant named Sokopol roams the territory around Edozalon and its volcanoes, and the folk of the city know to avoid him. When you are ready to depart, Amayali provides a map of the region outlining the path to Twin Gods Observatory. The path to Twin Gods Observatory snakes through the rainforest, then climbs into the hills near the Twin Gods volcanoes. Trails along a river lead to the town of Shoshotla. From there, path leads to the observatory. The whole trip takes just over a day to complete at a normal pace. While you travel, the earth occasionally shakes anew, filling your journey with hazardous obstacles along the way. Eventually, you make it to Shoshotla. Tlaatepec's capital city, Shoshotla, is a refuge for those forced to evacuate settlements elsewhere in the region. Its founder, Metzli, sought a safe place for her family and made a significant offerings to the gods. In return, the gods created a stable plain where she built her new home. A group of guides and explorers called the Trail Keepers based their operations in Shoshotla. From here, the group keep paths across the region safe and clear. They are often at odds with fire giants that dwell among the volcanoes, who claim that their homes were destroyed when the gods moved the mountains to create Shoshotla's plain. As you peruse through the town, you restock on supplies and rest before heading off on the last stretch of your journey. Just as you are leaving Shoshotla, an impossible figure to ignore hails you. This is Alin, a tiefling performer with turquoise patterned skin. They're headed the same direction as you and is eager to travel alongside both for company and protection. The dancer is kind-hearted but has an over-the-top stage persona they rarely let slip. In return, they offer to be your guide and good luck charm on the road. You agree to Allen's offer and begin your travel once more. It takes a few hours for your journey to take you to the Twin Gods Observatory. Above the trees on the rocky slope ahead rises a tower covered in elaborate carvings of local animals and majestic mountains. Beyond it, smoke rises from a volcano peak. Twin Gods Observatory is home to a group of scholars and regional guardians called the Watchers of the Ashes. These scientists observe and record the behavior of the Latepix volcanoes, predicting eruptions and warning locals before danger strikes. The observatory itself is a narrow but high tower. When you arrive, three watchers greet you with a hint of disdain. The watchers explain they are aware of the unusual volcanic activity and are doing their best to determine the cause, but their work will proceed faster if they're not interrupted. They initially claim to know nothing about warriors of Edisalon. 
you are able to convince a watcher to behave more hospitably, whereupon the acolyte shares the following information. The observatory has been besieged by inquiries from across the land seeking answers the scholars don't have. Dozens of volcanoes are showing activity across the Latepic, which is unprecedented. The acolyte doesn't recall warriors from Edisalon arriving, but the watcher's leader, Tanali, might. Tanali has been tirelessly observing the volcanoes from atop the observatory. Figuring that meeting Tonali would be a good idea, you make your way into the observatory. The interior of Twin Gods Observatory is hollow, with a spiral stone staircase rising to a roof with a commanding view of the region. Carvings along the observatory's interior depict volcanic events and smoke formations, which the watchers consult to inform their predictions. You note a carving inside the observatory of a gigantic, frilled reptile bursting from an exploding volcano. You ask the watchers about it and identify this creature as a mythical being called a Thleshalotl, a spirit said to sleep in volcanoes. Most watchers don't believe the Thleshalotls are real. When you climb about half the height of the observatory, the structure begins shaking and a crack like a thunderclap sounds from below. The structure is collapsing. The leader of the watchers, Tanali, is on the rooftop when the structure begins to collapse. You rush to the rooftop and encourage him to flee back down the stairs immediately. Desperate to escape, he eagerly follows your instructions. Everyone is able to make it out of the tower just in time. When you step foot out of the tower, it collapses into a heap of stone and rubble. As dust rises from the ruins of Twin Gods Observatory, the earthquake ceases and everyone survives. Once saved, Tanali is thankful for your help. You explain why you came and Tanali tells you what he knows. Amayali's warriors have arrived three days earlier. At the time they arrived, Tanali didn't have any theories about what was causing the eruptions, but he knew they were strongest near the volcano called Jade Mount. Tanali sent the warriors to the Gate of Illumination, a shrine to the gods on Jade Mount, to see if they could learn anything more. They haven't returned. Just before the observatory collapsed, Tanali's research convinced them that the cause of the eruptions is the Thaleshalatl, a spirit of the volcanoes. Tales say many of the volcanoes in Thaletepic have Thaleshalatls dwelling within them. Tanali believes these volcanic spirits are gradually awakening at once, which in turn increases the activity of their volcanoes. Based on his observations, Tanali believes there's already an awakened Thaleshalatl near Jade Mount. Tanali regrets sending Amayali's people to the Gate of Illumination, he didn't realize the danger. He asks you to travel to the shrine to check on the warriors and seek signs of the volcanic spirit. Tanali marks a trail on your map leading to the Gate of Illumination, a well-known sacred site. At a normal pace, the journey takes a little over a day. At some point during your journey, you come upon the aftermath of a battle. Four bodies lie on the road ahead, all showing burn marks and spear wounds. Broken arrows and fragments of shattered wooden cart are strewn about. You investigate the bodies and find burns on them, along with sizable snake-like tracks nearby, suggesting the travelers were killed by salamanders. The tracks lead toward the Gate of Illumination. As you prepare to move on, a roar comes from a forced dead rise over the road. The towering figure of a fire giant pushes through the trees towards you. Go back, he yells. Abandon your offerings. You know not what you do. This is the fire giant, Shakapol, whom you have learned about in Edisalon. Shakapol wields a massive hammer but isn't interested in fighting unless he's attacked first. He blocks your way and tries to frighten you into returning the way you came. You calm the giant and convince Shakapol to talk. Like many of his kin, Shakapol dislikes the tendency of humanoids to build settlements near the volcanic mountains. The awakening volcanic spirit, however, have made the small folk of these lands the lesser of two evils. Shakapol's people have long known about the volcanic spirit that slumbered deep in the region's mountains and don't consider them myths. The Leshalotls dwell deeps in volcanoes. When their sleep is disturbed, volcanic eruptions often follow. The volcanic spirit that inhabits Jade Mount has awakened. Shakapol has seen it move inside the volcanic pool connected to the Gate of Illumination. Salamanders and fire snakes serve this volcanic spirit. They have been stealing offerings meant for the gods and are carrying them back to Jade Mount. Shakapol doesn't know why the volcanic spirit is hoarding offerings, but he has seen salamanders going to volcanoes throughout the region with them. While he's happy to fight any salamanders he encounters, 
He's too large to slip into the gate of illumination and find out what's happening there. You offer to do it in his stead, and Shakapul offers to travel with you and defend you along the way. The two of you head off to the Gate of Illumination to figure out the situation occurring in the area. The Gate of Illumination is a century-old shrine consecrated to the gods of nature, fire, and renewal. It's out on the slope of the Jade Mountain Volcano and tunnels to the Lake of Magma within the caldera. The slopes of Jade Mount are steep and treacherous to climb, making passage through the shrine the most direct route to the volcano's interior. As you near the Gate of Illumination, you see a well-traveled trail that climbs into the mountains, the haze of volcanic smoke hanging overhead. The path ends at the entrance to a cavern carved with images of divine figures and gigantic lizards amid cracking mountains, clouds, and geometric flourishes. Crimson light emanates from within, and the smell of sulfur is thick in the air. You brave through the mountain, and travel through the heat-filled tunnels until eventually making it to the shrine. The masonry of the shrine gives way to the natural formation of the volcano's caldera. A blast of heat and gas billows off the lake of magma rolling here. At the magma's edge stands a pair of ornate altars carved of obsidian. Nearby, four humans are slumped against the wall, their arms dangling from rusty manacles. Beyond, sooty rock juts into the molten lake. Something moves amid the lava. The magmatic pool at the heart of Jade Mount is the lair of a volcanic spirit named Itzel. The four humans chained to the wall are the missing warriors from Edisalon. Itzel emerges from the lava, demanding you leave. He explains the following. Itzel awoke several months ago and can tell that the other volcanic spirits across the region are still asleep. He treats these others as his family. Isel has instructed his salamander servants to make offerings at the volcanoes where his family dwells and wake them. So far, the salamanders have made some small offerings, causing other volcanic spirits to stir. He knows nothing of the vicious attacks they've conducted to fetch offerings for him. Hearing his story, you're able to talk Itzel out of his plans and persuade him to send his salamander allies away. Unfortunately, Itzel will be lonely if this happens. Allen offers to stay at the Gate of Illumination. Allen believes keeping Itzel content is more important and wants to help keep the region safe. They also like the idea of having a regular audience. The four missing warriors from Edisalon found their way to the Gate of Illumination and would have been killed by salamanders if Itzel hadn't been curious about them. Itzel couldn't understand them, so he had them manacled to the Western Wall. The warriors explained that the volcanic spirit didn't harm them, it seemed curious about them, not hostile. After you convince Itzel, the remaining salamanders and fire snakes in the region return to the plane of fire. Without offerings being made to awaken the region's other volcanic spirits, the volcanic threats cease, and you find your travels back to Edisalon free of volcanic dangers. Back in Edisalon, Amayali is eager to hear your story. Because the local warriors survived, the local children also showed the thanks of the whole community by gifting you a treasure an oxalotl-shaped decanter of endless water. Chapter 8 In the Mist of Mani Versha The adventure begins as you are in the city of Shugapur for the end of the competition called the Shanka Trials. Shaped and defined by its rivers, Shankavumi is a dynamic floodplain surrounded by mountains and crisscrossed by waterways. Most of the land is covered in swamp forests infested with unknown perils. Including Shugapur, there are three cities that stand proudly among the perils. Each city spreads out in concentric circles from its riverine temple. The innermost circle holds the city's senate house, main market, and academy, as well as the houses of wealthy citizens. Past these lie modest residential neighborhoods and trade wards. At its edges, each city slopes down to submerged rice fields before dissipating into the swamps. The skies of Shankavumi are eternally heavy with rain clouds, and even well-maintained buildings wear a fine coat of moss. To experience Shankavumi at its finest, one must visit during the Shanka Trials held every 12 years in one of three cities. A 12-day spectacle of skill and might, the trials feature contestants representing each city who entertain thousands of spectators. But the trials are more than a competition. They represent the origin story of the land and a pact endlessly renewed between the people and the riverines to whom the land belongs. Whatever your reasons are for coming here, you find yourself in the city of Shugapur. 
the city of Chugapur is teeming with onlookers enjoying the Shankar Trials. The Shankar Trials are a spectacle of art and athleticism. They take their name from Shankar Shells, the shells of conch mollusks which feature in Shankabumi's legend and are an icon of the land. These contests are held over a 12-day period every 12 years. Competitors come from all three of Shankabumi city-states, and they include some folk descended from survivors of the ruined city of Maniversha. The contests honor the region's reverends, spirits who hold power over the region's many rivers. The final event of this great competition is being held next to the temple of the riverine Irrawaddy. Countless spectators fill the surrounding streets and line the river. The crowd has assembled for the final event of the Shanka Trials, where a popular young prodigy, the dancer Amanisha Manavershi, called Nisha by her fans, is about to perform. Her name passes through the crowd with a buzz of excitement. Amanisha's performance is breathtaking, but it carries an edge of sadness. As she dances, an announcer explains the performance. Her performance represents the story of the city of Manavershi. It shows the mysterious destruction and the anguish carried by Nisha and all those Manavershas who will never return to their ancestral home. As the dance ends, a cheer rises from the crowd. You notice that Nisha's dance was outstanding and captured something meaningful to many people in the crowd. After brief deliberation, the trial judges produce a great conch shell trophy, the Riverine's Shanka. A judge bows, then beckons Nisha forward. Amid cheering and fanfare, she accepts the trophy and takes her place as the newest champion of the Shanka Trials. As Nisha raises the Riverine Shanka above her head and the Shanka Trials conclude, thunder rings out as the sky fills with clouds. From the formerly calm river, a surge of water rises, forming a towering wave that flings boats onto the banks. The massive wave crests in a mighty swell crashing toward the crowded shore in Riverine Temple. The plaza surrounding the Riverine Temple is thousands of feet long and packed with people. There's little you can do to stop the sudden wave, but quick thinking allows you to barely escape the disaster. This damage causes chaos across the open space, smashing vendor stalls, harming hundreds of people, and leaving behind a foot of standing water. At the base of the temple, water elementals that defend the temple emerge and attack those around it. Once the temple's guardians are dealt with, several people emerge from within the temple. From among them is the temple's leader, High River Singer, Plaban Batiali a 200-year-old halfling priest. Many are wounded, but thankfully everyone is alive. However, both Amanisha and the River and Shanka Trophy are missing. Plaban approaches you, and he says, The river came for Amanisha and the River and Shanka. The wall of water descended and flowed around us, seeking Amanisha as she tried to help others to safety. It seized her and the trophy, then pulled both of them away. Plaban is one of the judges of the Shanka Trials. Although riverines hold the power to control river water, Plaban doesn't believe this disaster is the doing of Irrawati, the spirit of Shagapur's river. Plaban felt a deep jealousy in the storm in the river. He fears that today's destruction might be linked to the catastrophe that befell the city of Maniversha. Tales of Maniversha's ruin tell of a sudden storm and a huge wave that rose above the swamp forest, then consumed the city. He believes Amanisha is the key to understanding what happened and wants you to find her. When you accept, Plaban admits the task won't be easy. The flooded swamp forests of Shankavumi are vast. He encourages you to find a boat and a guide who can take you upriver to search for Amanisha. Before you leave, Plaban gives you a small Shanka shell from the temple. This shell functions as a stone of good luck. You search along the river's edge to find the city's riverboats in disarray after the disaster. However, as you search, a boat pulls into the harbor. This is the vessel of a skilled Maji, or navigator, named Duka Maji Sugapori. He has just arrived back in the city. Although he appears human, his colleagues and passengers don't know that he's a were-tiger. While several bands of such lycanthropes dwell deep in the swamp forest of Shankavumi, Duka left his tribe and is trying to live as a human. He offers to guide you for a price, and you figure it'd be best for you to heed Plaban's advice and hire the man. Once Duka is hired, he tells you the following information. Duka was traveling toward Sugarpore when the wave struck. While approaching, he saw a current of water sparkle with an eerie green light and sweep away from the city. He has seen that same glowing ripple recently along local tributaries of the Irrawati River. The first time he saw it was 12 days ago, the first day of the Shanka Trials. 
He followed the glowing ripples, tracing them along a small river called the Dijorna. Duca suggests taking you to a series of waterfalls on the Tinjorna River in the hope of learning more from the riverine there. Imaji is ready to head off whenever you please. You tell him that you are ready and the two of you set off to the waterfalls on the Tijorna River. Duca pilots his skiff to the mouth of the Tinjorna River and eventually you approach the waterfalls. A gradually increasing roar drowns out the rainforest sounds long before the river turns, revealing a series of parallel waterfalls cascading from a ridge that runs alongside the river. A chain of sparsely forested islands lies along the far side of the river opposite the base of the falls. Duca explains this is where he met the riverine Tinjorna. He moors the boat amid the islands opposite the falls so you can attempt to call upon the riverine. As Duca ties up the boat, you notice several pairs of green feline eyes watching from amid the island's foliage. Upon landing on the island, Three hostile were-tigers in hybrid form emerge with longbows drawn. You talk to the were-tigers and convince them not to attack. When you converse with the were-tigers, it becomes clear that Duca and the were-tigers are familiar with each other. Duca and the were-tigers share the following information. The were-tigers think that the people of Shugapur have caused the disturbance. They seek to protect their territory from anyone who would harm it or the riverine Tijorna. The were-tigers haven't seen the riverine Tinjorna since he confronted Duca, but the riverine often frequents the pool atop the falls. Duca reveals he is a lycanthrop and was raised among the were-tigers who dwell in the forest. After conversing with you, the were-tigers encourage you not to linger in their territory. Then they depart. Duca makes no apologies for hiding his true nature and encourages you to continue your search for the riverine Tinjorna atop the falls. From where Duca moors his boat, you follow an indirect but mostly dry path to the cliffs. When you reach the top of the waterfalls, you find a strange sight. The adjacent waterfalls are fed by a broad, shallow pool surrounded by ancient mangrove trees. Twenty feet away, a young man with green skin walks atop the water, speaking softly while slowly circling two churning pillars of glowing green foam. Tinjorna, the riverine, is speaking in Auckland and is trying to calm down a pair of water elementals corrupted by the strange magic afflicting his river. You approach cautiously to calm the creatures and aid Tinjorna in pacifying the elementals. A moment later, the creatures vanish. Left behind is you and Tinjorna. Tinjorna is a youthful riverine who appears as a soft-spoken young man with long hair. He thanks you for your help and eagerly converses with you. He tells you that a week or so ago, Tinjorna felt an ancient power affecting his river, as if something were moving through the waters to the southwest. There's little in that direction except for a haunted area called the Forest of Hands. The Forest of Hands occupies much of the same land as the vanished Adirohit River in the disappeared city of Monaversha. The magic Tinjorna felt has angered many inhabitants of the surrounding swamp forest. He has his hands full of trying to calm them down. Tinjorna has seen no evidence of the lost dancer, Amanisha, he asks you to seek out the source of the magic affecting his river. You agree to help the riverine and he thanks you. From the waterfalls, the journey to the Forest of Hands takes Duca and you 10 hours. When you reach the Forest of Hands, the scent of swamp takes on the sweet stink of rotting flesh. Trees with drooping limbs stand amid the river, their branches like hundreds of gray hands and their dangling leaves like long, leathery fingers. This is the region's notorious angled trees plants that stink of rotting flesh and drip crimson sap. Pushing through the Forest of Hands eventually brings you to a clearing at the forest's heart. Several slow-moving waterways convene at a rocky island covered in moss and ruined stones. Atop it stands the blackened, rotting stump of a great tree. On the stump, Amanisha lies motionless. You rush to her side and wake her up. Nisha awakens in a fog, confused and disorientated. She calms down when you assure her that you've come to help. Nisha tells you that the wave that smashed Sugarpore sees Nisha and the riverine Shanka, then dragged them here. Once here, Nisha was attacked by a monstrous woman with gray skin that oozes crimson ichor. The fiend sees the riverine Shanka, declaring it belonged to her. It claimed this place marks the edge of the ruins of lost Manaversha. The fiend said that if Nisha thinks she's Manaversha, then she can be a prisoner here for the rest of her days. Before you can complete your conversation with Amanisha, a wall of fire spell springs up, separating you from your boat. A woman with tattered, ancient robes and skin the color of a drowned corpse walks out of the swamp. 
She yells out, Welcome, visitors. I am Gigi Bisha Manavershi. I'm sure you've heard of me. I know you've come to steal my trophy, the woman says, holding up the Riverine Shanka. But I am the last champion of Manavershi to win the Riverine Shanka, not this upstart. It cost me everything, but my victory is eternal. Gigi Bisha is a vicious soul from the land's past. Long ago, she made a deal with wicked forces that gave her longevity and fiendish powers, a bargain that ultimately resulted in the ruin of Manuversha. She is behind Amanisha's capture and is loath to let her prisoner escape. Despite her fiendish powers, she looks like an ancient withered human. After she finishes speaking, Jijabisha attacks. While she fights, Jijabisha mocks you claiming to be the last champion of Manavirsha and the only Manavirshi who can rightfully claim the Riverine Shanka. Eventually, your fight ends with her death. When Jijibisha Manavirshi is destroyed, all is silent for a moment before a voice drifts from beneath a tree stump at the center of the forest heart. You out there, calls a voice from beneath the tree stump. Has that horror been banished? Is she finally gone? Set things right. Set me free. The voice says he's a Dirahit. The riverine of the lost Adirohit River, which once nourished the great city of Manavirsha. Adirohit has been locked away for hundreds of years beneath a mighty mangrove that once adorned a temple built in his honor. Jijibisha trapped him here using her fiendish power and forced him to cause the flood in Sugarpore. Now that Jijibisha is gone, touching any blessed Shanka to the tree stump will release him. However, Amanisha urges you to consider cautiously. You probe Adirahit for more information and he tells you that long ago, Jijabisha Manavershi made a deal with a wicked god to give her fiendish powers that would ensure her victory in the Shanka Trials. Adirahit was outraged that humans would pervert the sacred trials and unleash the flood to punish the whole city by sinking it into the swamp. Jijabisha Manavershi survived though and declared herself winner of the trials. She used her sinister powers to bind Adirahit within his ruined temple. Jijibisha was delighted that she would be the last Manavershi to ever win the Shanka Trials, at least until Amanisha's victory. While Adirohit is captive now and has been used by Jijibisha, he was not when he sank Manavershi. It's up to you to determine whether you wish to free Adirohit. Amanisha has complex feelings about this, seeing Adirohit has a tie to her ancient people and one who could restore a measure of what was lost, but also a tempestuous being who destroyed her ancestors. If you free Adirohit, he emerges from the stump in a torrent of river water. He is an arrogant riverine who looks like a muscular, middle-aged man with white hair and blue skin. He thanks you for your service and brings forth treasure to reward you with. Adirohit is unapologetic for his past deeds, even if Amanisha or others ask him to explain Manaversha's fate. He's confident though that he can re-establish his river and that soon enough humans will build a new, greater city on its banks. He invites you to rest here under his protection and tell him how the world has changed. Amanisha has no interest in doing this though. What Adirohit did to Manavirsha fills her with anger. Ultimately, the riverine allows you to leave whenever you like but insists on rewarding you for freeing him before you do. The journey back to the Tenjorna River is uneventful. The riverine, Tenjorna, is enthusiastic to hear about your journey and thanks you for investigating. When you return to Sugarpore with Amanisha and the riverine Shanka, you receive a hero's welcome. Depending on Adirahit's fate, only time will tell how the riverine could change the waters of the swamp forest or whether he's lost forever.